I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, just fine. And how's your friend Bob? Just fine, just fine. You know what? What, what? I think he's kind of dumb. Why? Because I asked him a riddle and he didn't know the answer. Oh, that's terrible. What was the riddle? Well, what comes with the train, goes with the train, is no use to a train, but a train can't go without it. Oh, that's easy. Have you heard it before? Uh, no, no, I just figured it out now. What is it? Oh, that Bobby certainly is a dumb one. What is it? Oh, I wouldn't want to take the honor away from you for answering such a hard riddle as that. All right, I'll tell you. It's noise. Yes, noise. Oh, that Bobby sure is a dumb one. Are you sure you had figured it out? Why, of course I did. Oh, that Bobby certainly is. Are you sure you knew? Uh, don't you think it's time to read the funnies? Oh, yes, please. Puck the comic weekly, all right? I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. There's been an outburst of robberies around the town of Buckskin. The ringleader is a man called the Chameleon, because he always changes his disguise. Hoppy is working with the rangers to try to catch the man who is called the chameleon. The stagecoach has left the town of Buckskin with a strong box of gold. Thinking that the chameleon may be on this stagecoach, Hoppy has ridden after it. He's jumped off Topper and onto the stagecoach. In it, he finds a man with a patch over one eye who gives him some trouble. Hoppy knocks him out. At the sound of shots, Hoppy looks out the window to see a group of men trying to hold up the coach. Last picture, top row, he says... Well, if this meddlesome passenger I slugged is the chameleon, his friends aren't giving me a chance to see who's behind his disguise. Quickly, Hoppy opens the door of the coach, climbs up on top. Second picture, second row, he sees the box containing the gold and exclaims, Ah, a strong box. This is what they're after. The driver turns around. Hoppy says, I don't mind me. Keep your hands on those reins. Last picture, top row, is the stage for rounds a bend. Out of sight of the pursuing horseman, Hoppy, with a strong box in his hand, leaps off the coach. And none too soon. For a moment later, the band of horsemen ride by. Overtake the coach and stop it. Pull up there! Pull up there, will you? One of the riders yells, Now where's that strong box you're hauling? We'll take it off your hands. The driver answers, well, Somebody already beat you to it! Then the passenger, with a black patch over his eye, appears in the door of the stagecoach. He's telling the truth, boys. Cassidy slugged me before I could get to it. And he probably jumped off taking the loot with him. One of the horsemen says, Well, he can't have gone far. The passenger orders last picture. Double back and find him. And Hoppy, lying behind a tree a short distance away, sees the men turn around and head back in his direction. He doesn't have a horse. They'll surely find him. Yes, that many men searching the neighborhood. I don't know how they can miss finding Hoppy. Ooh, I'm afraid what they'll do to him because that passenger with that black patch over his eye looks awfully, awfully mean. Yes, he does. But well, we'll find out what happens next week. Now? Oh, now can we go over the page? Because I'm sure Prince Diamond is there. Well, you've been right so many times, I'm sure you're sure now. So over the page we go. And here we are, Prince Valiant on page three. And you remember, Prince Diamond and Arf were on a hunting trip, and as they were crossing a river that was flooded, a tree knocked their horses over, and their horses were drowned. And Prince Valiant and Arf can't walk back home because the long walk would be impossible for Arf who lost one of his legs in an accident and now has a wooden leg. No, so they're making a boat, and Val made a fire by striking two stones together like the Boy Scouts do, 
And then he got food from the river by spearing fish. Yes. Now let's see how they make out with their boat. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckett, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Val and Arf have spent their second night in the wilderness. And when morning comes, Arf arises to find Prince Valiant already up and standing in the shallows among the spawning salmon, spearing the day's supply of food. After breakfast, big picture top row, the boat building begins, and Arf sees the reason for yesterday's hard work. With all the materials assembled, trimmed, and shaped, the frame of the craft takes form quickly. Slender but sturdy branches are worked into the shape of a canoe. Then they're tied together by the thongs that Arf has cut out of the horse's skin. And first picture next row, nimble fingers and the ingenuity of men trained in self-reliance soon have the frame ready for covering. Then, into a seamless container of bark, Val puts spruce gum and balsam. Powdered charcoal is added as a binder. Next, a hot stone is dropped in. And soon they have a boiling, sticky liquid to serve for glue. Then the hides of the horses are spread over the frame and sewed into place. While they're sealing the seams with the liquid they have made, the wind dies away, and out from the marshy places come hundreds of mosquitoes. Oh, these mosquitoes eat you up, Bill. Last picture, second row, two very unhappy people finish the canoe. Finally, first picture, bottom row, the canoe is finished. Val has hung the salmon over the fire to cure, so they'll have food to take along on their trip. He and I have run to the fire and stand in the smoke of the fire, their eyes smarting. And here they wait until the chilling night winds shall drive the mosquitoes away. Next morning after breakfast, the canoe is launched, and Val and his crippled squire commit themselves to the unknown river, and they head for home. They are wagering their lives that their skill can offset all the dangers the thundering waters can present. Ooh, wasn't that wonderful? How they built that canoe out of trees? Out of the things they found out there in the forest? Yes, it just goes to show you how helpful it is to know about trees and nature. Yes, it certainly is. I wonder if they'll get home safely. After all, there are many waterfalls on the river, and after all, it was in the river that they had all the trouble in the first place. Well, we'll find out more about this next week. Now let's turn over the page. All right. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon. Yes, Flash Gordon. And remember last week he was saved from the flood and made friends with Prince Savvy, who was the new ruler of Mars. And Prince Savvy and Flash decided to work together so they could have peace, which I think is very sensible. Yes, it is. And then Flash started back toward Earth in a rocket ship. But when he was looking into that machine that he could see everything in, and then he saw that the Earth was all covered with ice. Yes, the Earth was entirely covered with ice. So let's find out now what Flash finds next. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rigga rigga doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. Firing his brake rockets for a landing on Earth, Flash is amazed to find that all North America is deep in snow and ice. Workers at the rocket port have managed to clear a small landing place. It's a tight squeeze, but Flash jockeys his giant ship in safely. As they get out of the ship, they can't believe their eyes. They see snow drifts as high as skyscrapers, and they wonder what could have happened. Last picture, top row, port director says, All right, come with me. I'll explain later. Flash is taken to a meeting of top-level scientists where he's shown telepictures of the strange calamity that has befallen the Earth. First picture, bottom row, the famous explorer scientist, Icy Stark, explains that a new electronic force in the upper air spreading down from the Arctic is shutting off the heat of sunlight, and he boasts, Other research jets and rockets have crashed, but my polar expedition will find the answer. Over Stark's bitter protests, the group assigns Flash to the project. Stark agrees grudgingly. Okay, 
I'll take Gordon and the girl, if they can get ready in time. We leave in an hour. Flash's reply is terse. We're ready now. Last picture, heavily loaded with supplies and apparatus. The expedition roars north into the flaring aurora borealis. Flash tells Stark, You know, this change of the northern lights is too sudden for a freak of nature. I've got a hunch at some interplanetary attack. Stark's reply is a contemptuous sneer of disbelief. But Dale is sure that Flash is right. My goodness, does Flash mean that it's possible for someone who is making war on the Earth to change the air and, and to shut off the sunlight? That's exactly what Flash is saying. Well, just think, Flash should come back to Earth to work for peace, and now he's found out that someone's doing this. Isn't that terrible? Yes, it is. Well, I hope that man Stark doesn't call Flash too much trouble. Well, we'll find out more about that next week. Now, how would you like to see what Dick is doing? Oh, yes, please. Dick's adventures are so exciting. You bet they are. So let's go to the very last page of the first section. The very last page of the first section, and here's Dick's adventures. And you remember that Dick is in the early days of America on an expedition into the Wild West with Captain Lewis and Captain Clark. Yes, and they've worked their way up the Missouri River to where it begins, in the Rocky Mountains. And that was where there were some waterfalls, and they had to travel on land for 16 miles around the waterfalls. And they, they put sails on their boats, which were on wagons. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Yes, but it worked. They were moving steadily through a ravine, helped by the wind, which was pulling their wagons along. Ships on land. And then the wind died down, and the wagons were too heavy for the men to pull. What'll happen now? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. <laughs> dies down, the heavy wagons come to a stop. The men are wondering what to do. On a cliff above, three mysterious white men are watching the Lewis and Clark expedition below. Suddenly, the sky darkens. And a moment later, last picture top row, a storm of frightful intensity bursts down on the Americans. Torrents of water fill the ravine, and they're bombarded with hailstones the size of rocks. The Americans are caught in the flood, which sweeps down on them. First picture next row, for a few minutes longer, the three strangers watch the Americans struggling frantically to escape from the ravine, now turned into a raging flood. One of the men says, Gah, let them drown. That's what we want. No. But the leader shouts angrily. Yes, they are our enemies, but it is good to let men die like this. Anyway, I have a better plan. He leads the way, and the three strangers quickly go to work, throwing lines to the men struggling in the flooded ravine. Last picture, second row, to Dick and his comrades, the sudden appearance of help by three strange men is nothing short of a miracle. One by one, the men are saved from the rushing waters. And then, first picture, bottom row, the three strangers work like men of mercy, doing everything possible to give aid to the bruised, half-drowned Americans, even saving most of their stores and equipment. When the storm is over... The men dry themselves out of the fire. Captain Lewis turns to the leader of the three men and says, Gentlemen, we owe you our lives. The United States government shall learn of your heroism. I shall report it myself to Mr. Jefferson when, God willing, we reach the Pacific and return. But who are you? And then, last picture, the miracle abruptly ends. In cold, harsh tones, the leader speaks. We want no recognition from the United States government. We are soldiers of Spain. You will never be allowed to reach the Pacific. Isn't that strange? He saves their lives and, and then tells them he's their enemy. That he's going to do everything he can to stop the Americans from getting to the Pacific. Yes, that is strange behavior. Yes. Well, what if the Americans want to fight them? Then that man will kill them. I, I just don't understand him. Well, maybe we'll find out something next week to make you understand this. Now look below Dick's adventures. Oh, look, Rusty Riley. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now 
Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty and Peter followed the two crooks, Sir Percival and Nobbs, to the old abandoned house where they had hidden the valuables they'd stolen from Mr. Miles' safe. Thinking that Nobbs and Sir Percival have gone back to town in the car, they've slipped into the old house to search for the valuables. Just as they found the loot in the basement, they heard a door slam on them. Rusty exclaims, hey, Gosh, Pete, somebody bolted the door to this cellar. We're trapped down here. Pete replies, Hey, good night. Sir Percival and his man Nobbs must have come back. Yeah, gee, Wilkins, if they know we found where they hid the horseshoe trophies, there's no telling what they'll do to us. Yeah, you're right. We better put them back quick. Last picture, top row. As Pete starts to lower the loot in the hole where they found it, Rusty says, Hey, wait a second, Pete. I got an idea. Let's try to find a new hiding place for the stuff and then fill the hole they dug as if we hadn't discovered it at all. Yeah, swell. If they think we're not wise to them, they may let us go. So quickly, they look around for a place to hide the stuff. First picture, bottom row, Pete says, Hey, Rusty, hey, hey, look what's under this rubbish. A shallow cistern still has water in it. Hey, and water won't hurt the trophies. Let's drop them in quick and put the rubbish back. Meanwhile, second picture, bottom row. Outside the old house, Nobbs, who has been standing guard after locking the boys in, hears footsteps coming up the path and then sees Sir Percival in the moonlight. Percival says... Well, I returned the car to the rental service, Nobbs, and caught a bus out here right away. Is everything all right? Yeah, we got a couple of visitors, Pers. Them kids followed us in that art hall. The kids are locked in the cellar, and the jalopy is behind the barn. I say, Nobby, why the long face? Fortune still smiles on us. Now we have a car. Let the boys out one at a time so we can tie them up. There's plenty of sash cord in these old windows. All right, boys, but you've got to help the ain't no babies, you know. Last picture, Nobbs comes out of the house with Rusty and Pete. Sir Percival says... Now, my dear young friends, your interest in our activities has become a trifle embarrassing. Consequently, we are about to enjoy a ride in your remarkable car. It'll be a bit crowded, but we'll manage. Get the car, Nobby. Pete answers... You won't get away with this, you you big phony. Why are they going to take the boys away with them? I don't know. You don't think they will hurt the boys, do you? I can't answer that either. That Percival, you never can tell what's going on in his mind. He's a clever creature. Oh, I, I wish the detectives will find them before they leave. Well, maybe they will. They well, haven't gotten away yet. My, I, I hope they get them. Well, let's stop worrying now, though, and read Dagwood and Blondie. All right, here they are on the first page of the second section. And we won't tarry a second. Here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. And say the magic words with me, please. Ram a food, ram a fum, zim zam zombie. zombie. Come give me music, music for Dagwood, Dagwood and Blondie. And Dagwood sees a letter lying on the table. He picks it up and says to his daughter, Cookie, you forgot to mail this letter for me. No, I didn't, Daddy. I was so busy playing, I didn't have time to mail it. Dagwood gets so angry, he burns. And he exclaims, Excuses! All I get around here is excuses! Then he turns to Alexander, last picture top row. And I thought I asked you to pick up my shoes at the shoe repair shop. Well, I I, I was going to do it tomorrow, Pop. Dagwood gets so angry, he boils. He goes into the kitchen, first picture next row. He sees Blondie warming up a can of soup on the stove. He says, and you, 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 you promised me this morning we'd have corned beef and cabbage for supper. Blondie replies, I'm sorry, dear. Mrs. Woodley dropped in for a chat, and I didn't get a chance to go to the market for corned beef. And Dagwood's so angry, he howls, (laughs) More excuses! Everybody has an excuse for not doing what they're supposed to do. And he goes into the living room and settles down in a chair, yelling, depended on. I wish you'd all learn to be reliable like I am. Short time later, Blondie decides to put up the draperies. She says to the children, first picture, next row. The ladder is broken. Would you please hold it for me while I put up these drapes? Oh, sure, Mom. So Alexander holds one side of the ladder and Cookie the other side. And Blondie climbs up the ladder to hang the drapes. Up, up, up she goes. When suddenly the ladder starts to slip. 
Hey, it's slipping, Mom. I can't hold it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Dagwood, help! Dagwood leaps to his feet. Last oh. picks a third roll. His legs begin to quiver. He takes one step. First picks a bottom roll. Hurry, Dagwood, hurry! Suddenly his feet collapse, and he crumbles to the floor. And he hears... Last picture, he crawls into the dining room and sees Blondie and the children lying in a heap around the ladder. And he says, my foot was asleep. And Blondie, who's steaming with rage, replies, that's the worst excuse I ever heard. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah. After saying that he's the only person they can depend upon around here, then he can't get out of his chair to go to the other room to stop the ladder from falling down. As he spoke a little too soon. <laughs> yes, sometimes I think he shouldn't brag at all. Well, maybe we'd all be better off if we never bragged. Yes, maybe we would. Well, now look underneath Dagwood and Blondie. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that. Because you remember last week when Roy had gone to the lumber camp to help some friends who were having lots of trouble? Yes, and old Cosmo, who loves trees and hates people who chop them down, sent a pile of logs rolling down after Roy. And the logs crashed into the engine house and set it on fire. And then another man up in the mountains captured that old man named Cosmo, and he told him he wanted old Cosmo to help him destroy Roy. I wonder what his scheme is. Let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip by o Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by o The fire has been put out and the donkey engine has been repaired. Roy and Wildwood ride off to search for old Cosmo to settle the score. Aunt Pauline has warned them to be careful because she's not sure that Cosmo's the only one responsible for all the accidents in her camp. Third picture top row, they come upon Etch Sneed. Wildwood asks him if he's seen anything of Cosmo. He tells him, Well, I saw his moth eating burrow over by the river Skidway, Wildwood. And as they ride off, last picture top row, he says to himself, <laughs> It worked. If old Cosmo's ready, Rogers is a dead timber duck. And I'm back in the log pirating business. <laughs> First picture bottom row, they come to the top of a hill overlooking the river skidway, which is a chute leading from the top of the hill down to the river below, on which the logs are slid down into the water. Roy says, Why now you wait here and keep your eyes skinned, Wildwood. I'll sneak up quiet like. As Roy approaches the skidway, old Cosmo hears his steps approaching. Cosmo hides and crouches behind the logs at the head of the skidway. He's holding a log hook in his hands, and he says to himself, Hey, Rogers at last. And Etch says if I do away with him, he won't turn me in to Pauline Bunyan for tormenting her timberman. As Roy steps to the edge of the chute, Cosmo stands up and clubs him. <coughs> Roy tumbles headlong down the chute. And I'll pay for helping those ornery loggers destroy the poor trees in the forest. Last picture as Roy tries to get to his feet, Cosmo yells, So long, mister. Now see if you can slide down the grease skidway before the next log overtakes you. <laughs> oh, look. Roy's lying on his back sliding down that chute, and there's that great big log that's going to be dropped down on it, too. And if that log crashes down on Roy, I don't see how he'll ever escape. Neither do I. Do you think Roy will ever escape? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now? Oh, now? Could we read Uncle Remus? I think we could. Let's turn over the page. Go past little iodine, past the little king, turn over another page, and there's Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says, When Br'er Rabbit starts out to prove something, he generally makes a mighty good argument. The Br'er Rabbit sees a yellow hammer. That's a bird flying around in the air. He points to it and says, Well, 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 look at yonder with old Br'er Yellow Hammer flying in his sleep. Br'er Coon replies, hey, What you mean? Birds don't fly in their sleep. Why, of course birds fly in their sleep, same as folks walk in their sleep. Why, well, you always loosen the head, Br'er Rabbit. I don't believe it. Whereupon Br'er Rabbit takes Br'er Coon by the arm, third picture top row, and leads him down the road, saying, All right, come on then. I'll prove it to you by Br'er Buzzy. They 
comfortable buzzard lying sound asleep at the foot of a tree. Last picture, top row. Burr Rabbit says, Now you watch, Burr Coon. And he leans down and says in Burr Buzzard's ear, Burr Buzzard, there's a cloud up yonder with a silver lining. Start flying. Burr Buzzard hears him in his sleep. And he raises up and starts to flap his wings. Burr Rabbit says, first picture, bottom row. You can use some of that silver lining, Brill Buzzard. Get going. And Brill Buzzard starts flying around. Brill Rabbit says, There you see, he's flying. Yeah, but, 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 but how do you know he's flying in his sleeve? Suddenly, Brill Buzzard flies straight into a tree. <laughs> and he drops to the ground unconscious. And there he lays with a different kind of snore. Br'er Rabbit says, Well, now what did you say, Br'er Coon? Br'er Coon throws up his hands and replies, Well, anyways, Br'er Buzzard sure is sleeping now. And Uncle Remus says, Yes, yeah, she is believing and uh, sometimes deceiving. <laughs> Well, it makes as much sense as people walking in their sleep. <laughs> well, I suppose it does. <laughs> anyway, Bear Rabbit proved it with the Bear Buzzard, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he certainly, certainly did. Well, now that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more information. <laughs> Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.